Welcome everyone. My Horse University and the Equine Network would like to welcome you all and are excited to offer horse enthusiasts a science-based fun series of courses on horse breeding and selection. And these series, as you know, consist with the four live web presentations as well. This is the second live web presentation of the series. Dr. Mark Russell from Purdue University will be presenting your next competition horse. Dr. Russell is a professor of animal science and veterinary and clinical sciences at Purdue University. He earned his college degrees at Cornell University and the University of Illinois before moving back to Indiana. He has served as an extension horse specialist and has advised horse owners on issues of horse selection, facilities, nutrition, pastures, breeding, and general management. He has judged several um, national shows as well as international shows as well. We would like to thank our sponsors for this short course and live web presentation series with Purina Mills, Horse Tech, and Iron Spring Farms. Please feel free to ask questions pertaining to the slides during the presentation through the text chat. We will also have time at the end of the presentation for questions and answers as well. Please welcome Dr. Mark Russell. Happy to um, be a part of the evening program. Um, as I progress the slides to um, uh, where we're trying to uh, progress, I want you to feel free to text message. And if you're not um, with me or there's something I'm not clear about, please um, feel free to uh, interact. This should be very informal, and I hope it's meaningful for those of you. And obviously, um, if you've already bought a horse and you've already made all these mistakes and things that I have done uh, in my career, then um, feel free to uh, tell me that in a text message, and I'll share that with the whole group as well. Um, if anyone's having trouble hearing me, let me know or let Kate know as we go along. But Overall, this is a very broad topic, as you can imagine, and it's one that I think we start out with trying to say you've got to decide, and only you can decide uh, what you need, what you want. Uh, somewhere deeper in the slides, it says everybody wants a Ferrari, when maybe we just need an old Chevrolet, and there's times that um, uh, it can be very simple as that, and there's more to it than that, but you have to decide what it is you seek, uh, how high do you want to go in your competition and maybe the next horse isn't um, the last horse but um, for a lot of our owners um, the next horse is the one that they struggle with and my advice is if you're sitting here wondering I'm not sure I know enough to select my next horse uh, then I think you need to get advice from people um, that know more than you do so my first suggestion is to network. Uh, network with people that um, show horses, train horses, compete horses, do what it is you think you want to do with the horse. Uh, this is me sitting in an empty Keeneland sale ring. Uh, it's pretty easy to buy a horse at an auction when you're the only one there, but um, in general I would say that you need to spend more time than you would have um, at the auction site itself, but rather go visit the horse, drive it, ride it, mess with it, um, interact with it. Uh, if you really like it, some owners will let you take the horse and uh, have a trial period where you can see if it works out. But I'd say that's unusual. But it's your responsibility to ask the right questions and ask about background and history. Um, you have got to be proactive. And uh, certainly, when I'm buying a horse, I would um, want to make sure I knew the person from whom I'm buying it. I would want to know that I've got somebody that I can interact with. Uh, I would want time to go and visit the horse and interact, as I said, uh, with the horse as we go along. Um, uh, we've put some slides together that kind of follow the content that was described and also the uh, support materials. And again, we're not going into very much detail tonight because you know, there's a whole course on horse behavior here at, at Purdue, and there's a whole course in structural anatomy and so forth. So we're just going to touch on some of the big headings, and I really hope that you'll ask some questions. Uh, we don't have a tremendous number of people on tonight, so I hope that you'll be able to uh, ask questions as we go or, or wait to the end. But um, I think for an awful lot of our owners, we're going to look at three things later on in the, the presentation, and it 
One is confirmation, uh, one is certainly um, movement and athletic ability, and one is disposition. Um, but the history of the horse will tell us whether other people have gotten along with the horse. Uh, if it's a horse that's had lots of owners, there may be a, a problem with this particular horse. Uh, visit the horse's barn, not just watch him ride or drive what you want to do with him, but See, maybe if he'll load, maybe on a trailer, maybe he's got big old craters in his stall, or maybe he's um, been cribbing or chewing. This gray horse here is actually a thoroughbred from Ireland. This is at the Irish National Stud that I took this summer, but here's a famous multi-million dollar um, stallion that's cribbing or, or wind sucking, if you will, on the top boards of, of their fence. Uh, obviously, this athlete uh, racing horse up here might be a, a real good uh, athlete, but he's not necessarily the competition that, uh, horse that you need if you want a quiet, uh, docile kind of horse that will just teach you how to uh, post and, and get around at a horse show. So you have to decide what level of training and experience you want the horse to have, and uh, there's no right answer for that. Uh, if you have lots and lots of experience, maybe you want to train and work with a horse um, that's a little tougher, but a lot of those really great, great athletes have us charisma about them. They have a, an attitude like this horse did not want to be passed on the track. So um, I think you need to decide what it is uh, that you want. Then I would say that you need to look into a, a, uh, a pre-purchase exam and decide whether you have the knowledge that you need to really be able to make this decision by yourself. And frankly, that depends on your experience and the value of the horse, how much money I'm spending. I'm going to go back just to see because sometimes I hit the button twice. Thank you. Um, I think whether it's a veterinarian or it's an experienced um, trainer or owner or somebody down the road, you need a third party to say, you know, you're being a little emotional about this. Uh, my wife always plays that role for me and vice versa, but we need somebody other than us because it's our money that we're spending. And if you want to get a veterinarian to inspect the horse or farrier, um, you need to choose who that is. Somebody you already know or someone that comes highly recommended to you. Um, this is a picture that I took of a veterinarian. This is Conrad Nightingale from um, um, right outside of San Antonio, Texas, and he's kind of doing a chiropractic exam on the horse. He's doing a flexion exam in the hind legs of this horse. Um, that's Jim Keith, our Purdue farrier, standing there evaluating, and they went over this horse really with a fine tooth comb, and then they decided how many radiographs they needed or ultrasounds or other things based on the value of the horse. So if you're spending a thousand or two thousand dollars for a horse and you know what you want, um, I wouldn't spend a thousand dollars in in assessments of, of soundness, because the bottom line is, as you can see up above there, suitable to do what and serviceably sound for what purpose. Uh, my horses, uh, my wife's horses, we always joke at home, are serviceably sound because this time of year they're sound enough to come in the barn and eat and go back out in the barn and eat hay and come back in the barn and eat. They're serviceably sound to do nothing, actually, this time of year. Uh, she gives a lot of riding lessons to young children, so we don't need the fastest athlete in the world. In fact, if they had a little bit of ring bone, a little bit of age on them, maybe that's not so bad. Maybe that's exactly what we need to teach uh, six- and seven-year-olds to post. So you have to decide how much uh, you want to spend. And, uh, I think oftentimes owners are, are conned into, if you will, spending way more on radiographs that might show a little bit of a spur, a bone problem in the hawk, um, and might be cause for concern, and the veterinarian suggests not buying the horse, when in fact, he might be plenty sound for what you're doing. So yes, you need a third party, but no, I don't think you need to spend a lot of money um, in evaluating horses. but. Use your eyes, use your own experience, use your own visit, if you will. Um, and I do think you need a third party opinion as we go along. Now we go into an area that uh, I don't want to go in too much depth, but I spend a lot of time in our classes here, just like they do at most universities, trying to make sure university students understand the physiology and the, the biomechanical movement and the structure and all those things. But all you really can assess is, is the structure that you can see and evaluate and movement. 
how sound are they? In other words, are they free from lamenesses and so forth? Uh, and then how do they behave? What's what's their their attitude, if you will? Uh, and we're going to talk about all three of those things. Um, and again, ask questions as we go along. And if you want to wait, that's fine. But we're going to just charge forward until you uh, type in that text chat and interrupt me. Um, I want to emphasize three things as we look at our performance horses. If if we're going to have a performance horse that's uh, an athlete, is a high-level competition horse of any form or sort, it's got to have athletic movement. So I want to start with movement, and we're going to talk a little bit about that and how I define locomotion and movement. Um, then we'll go into the structure and the conformation that um, I think allows that movement. Uh, and then just touch again on disposition a little bit at the end. Now, what are we not going to discuss? When we evaluate your next horse, you may say, well, he didn't say it had to be an Arabian or it had to be a Tretainer or it has to be a Belgian or a quarter horse or whatever. I'm going to leave things like the breed of the horse, the height of the horse, the color. Some of you are Palomino breeders and say, well, if it's not the right shade of Palomino, then I don't want it. You know, And that's going to be important to some of you as you evaluate. Uh, certainly pedigree and genetics are important as they affect, in my opinion, this, this athletic ability through movement and conformation and disposition. So there's a lot of other things that are important as we would evaluate whether we would buy it. If you show at, at uh, a breed circuit, if you will, or a breed competition, you're really only going to be looking at your breed of horse because you're, you're probably not going to hang out with those same folks if you uh, change breeds and, and show somewhere else. So uh, let's go into what I'm talking about um, as far as movement. You could define movement in lots and lots of different ways, but um, I would say, as after working with a lot of trainers and, and training some horses and judging a lot of shows my, myself, is all of the push, all of the impulsion of the horse, drive of the horse, comes from its rear end. Uh, so first we have to be able to get our rear end underneath us, and you can't see this horse's rear end on my uh, visual, but uh, you can sure see that they've got to get their head underneath them in order to lift the front end. And I had a good old walking horse trainer from Decatur, Illinois once say to me, if I could get his center of gravity back over the tail, then it'd be pretty easy to lift him in front and make him a big lick mover. And I would say that's true of dressage and reining and all kinds of horses. If they can get their weight back underneath them, then that just makes their job moving in front easier. So let's think about confirmations that make it easier to lift the front end, make it easier to, to engage that hind end and, and really get their loin and their hip underneath them. So whether we're talking about dressage, what, no matter what kind of event horse we're talking about, we need to be able to flex, if you will, coil, if you will, through the back and the loin muscles to be able to take that engaged hind end uh, hock and, and foot and be able to drive it up uh, underneath itself to lift the front end of this horse. Uh, he looks like he's pretty balanced in his movement. He's got good extension in his shoulder and his forearm. Uh, but that's only possible because the hind end in the back got him off the ground. So we really have to think about, as we evaluate structure, a lot of people talk about conformation and how straight they are. But my concern is they can be really, really straight and heavy muscled in front, and run downhill, be straight legged, but uh, uh, have trouble ever lifting the front end. So let's think about those confirmations to do the job you seek, not, not to make them all dressage horses or something, but to make them the horses that you want in order to be able to do their job. Uh, thoroughbred yearlings are purchased primarily um, standing still in confirmation and then how they walk. Um, some of your disciplines you've stopped evaluating the walk in my opinion, but um, the reality is even in hand, horses be, should be able to put their back foot up and come past where the front foot left the ground. And in fact, when I'm judging a uh, Oh, hunter in hand in some uh, disciplines and, and dressage horses and, and uh, uh, racing prospects and things. If you watch a move, I'll put right on my scorecard a plus three, plus five, minus two. So if it's a plus two or three or five, that's how many inches past the spot where the horse's foot, the front foot left the ground, 
where the hind leg would, would um, come and hit the ground. And you'd sure like them to be overreaching. And I don't mean just walking horses, folks. I mean even your pleasure horses, even your hunter horses, need to be able to reach right up there and put their foot in the ground. Because if they can do that walking, and I know I've spent a lot of time trying to train uh, thoroughbred walking racing horses, yearlings, to walk well enough to do that. But this engagement is important in any breed. So we need to really think about how do we assess. You can't always get on and ride them and move them and see if they do. And if you can do that, that's great. You can see the left hock and hind end of this um, lower level dressage horse that's really reaching up there. And he's got a high level of collection uh, for a, a horse that's uh, cantering around the corner uh, in his test. So um, engagement's really, really important. And um, that would leave movement, I guess. I've got it at the end of the list here, but I think I've just talked about it to the extent that, that I would want to uh, for tonight. And then we'll come back and look at really the components of confirmation. And this is pretty much standing still, whether we're Western horses, hunter horses, dressage, race horse, whatever kind of horse you have, uh, he really needs to be balanced. And let's talk about these things and what I mean uh, by these structural things uh, before we get to some decisions about actually buying the horse at the end. Uh, a lot of people talk about balance in different ways. Uh, this diagram shows balance in what I would call a horizontal way. All the parts fit together and are proportional from front to back. And I know you have another course and a lot of support material in this uh, series that goes into confirmation and, and anatomy, uh, but I'd like to see this horse's uh, head to neck to shoulder particularly be about a third in his shoulder, a third in his back or his, his thorax area, thoracic cavity area, and a third in his hip and hindquarter area. If he has this proportionality, then you're going to probably say he's pretty well balanced. Uh, if you think he's really, really long in his back, we need to think about what that means and look at some issues, but some people would argue that a driving horse needs to be a little longer in his back, but certainly the riding horses and the performance horses that I've had experience working with, the shorter and stronger the back, the tighter and, and more muscle in the loin or coupling, the better. Um, but it, we need to have that middle section be as short as possible. Um, these blue lines got moved on this graphic, so ignore those. But what I would like to see is um, what, not horizontal, but vertical balance. And um, picture a blue line, if you will, that goes from the top of his croup to the top of his withers. The biggest, hardest thing it is for an athlete to be able to lift his front end as if he runs downhill from his top of his croup to the top of his withers. This is a drawing, and it looks to me like this horse runs downhill just a little bit. Uh, Oren Mixer drew a really nice diagram or a nice picture here, but I think uh, uh, for me, uh, when you see a croup that's higher than the withers, it makes it that much harder to lift the front end. If we were to draw that straight line down and come down from his top of his withers to the bottom of his, his uh, heart girth, that ought to be really, really deep, and it ought to be about the same distance from his withers to the bottom of his sternum, if you will, or his chest, from uh, the as it is from there to the ground. Uh, these are called um, points of balance that I would say. So this is vertical balance. A lot of uh, old horsemen used to tell me, well, I like their knees and their hocks close to the ground. What they really mean is they'd like to see as much of the horse up in its body uh, and as, as little of the horse, frankly, as is possible down in their lower legs. So uh, this is vertical balance. Um, Another way to look at it would be this, this what I would say earlier is, is um, proportionality. Um, and if you look at this trapezoid, we'd like to see a shorter back and a long athletic underline. This starts with the angle of the scapula, or the shoulder. And we'll look at that in just a second. But the front angle is the shoulder. The back angle is more or less the angle of the hip. Um, so the longer that the bottom part is, that probably means the more sloping is in his shoulder uh, and the longer, more athletic he is uh, in the angle of his hip. So uh, both of these, some of you have been taught to look at proportionality by drawing triangles, an upside down triangle in his shoulder, a one that's right side up with a point at the top in his back and then upside down the hip, or three circles. I've seen um, 
those kinds of diagrams. But the important thing is when you get back away from the horse and you look at this horse, you see that this is an overall balanced movement. Now, these are both young horses, a weanling and a yearling, but even at this age, you should be able to see horses that are able to move uh, in a balanced way. Certainly there's differences in breeds here and, and all of that, but in both cases I'd like to see the the rump or the croup, if you will, as long and smoothly turned and as well muscled as possible. And then in the loin, which to me is the key to the whole driver, uh, we need to uh, have that as tight and as strong over his back as we can because again that's where the impulsion is going to come from so I'm sure that all of you already know this but I'm just trying to remind you that when you're looking at horses and evaluating performance ability balance is the most important thing we have to look at a horse that's balanced before we go into all the details of his structural correctness and uh, how he's doing in his, his legs and things um, about 20 years ago, I did this survey of uh, about 100 trainers of all different breeds when I was at the University of Illinois, uh, and I asked, what structures give you the most headaches keeping a horse sound in training? And these are the kinds of answers that I got, and frankly, they're in the order that I got them. This is not necessarily athletic ability. Many of you know horses that are very crooked in their legs uh, or have structural problems, but by golly, they can run fast or jump high, but they might not do it for very many years. So we're looking at two very different conformations. Uh, vertical angles, these are angles in the mostly in the shoulder, uh, in the pastern, in the stifle to hock, uh, very posty behind. These are horses that uh, uh, end up getting very um, uh, a lot of concussion and strain and uh, concussion on you as a rider, but also on their joints uh, as they uh, attempt to perform and, and pound the ground, if you will. They have a lot of bone issues that uh, we could talk about on soundnesses at great length, uh, and we won't. But um, the opposite is also true, that very weak, low angles of pasterns, uh, these cause soft tissue problems in the bow tendons and, and suspensory ligament problems and things. So uh, confirmation definitely dictates movement, but also dictates the likelihood to stay sound. Then we have, and we'll talk about these a little bit, but extremely towed out or splay footed horses. These are horses that put a lot of strain and have medial splint bone problems or bench knee to knee problems. Uh, oftentimes hit themselves even when they move calf knee or back at the knees or hyperextension of the, the carpal bones. You can see even in this cross country horse here, this hurdler, uh, when he comes off the ground uh, and lands, all of his weight's going to land on this front right foot first, the way he's cantering, and he's going to put all that stress strain and concussion on his, his foot, on his pastern, on his tendons, on his suspensory ligament, on his knee. And if he's offset in his knees or he's back at the knees, these are certainly problems that are going to be accentuated um, because he's going to hyperextend that joint. So um, any extreme angles uh, that are not straight and vertical are going to get us in problems if the horses worked hard enough. Again, um, this may be fine, and they might get along fine if you're not going to stress them at great performance levels. But when you take horses to high levels, folks, it puts a lot of stress on their joints. And when they come out of training for a month or a month and a half or two months, uh, depending on the problem with one of these unsoundnesses, it's expensive. It costs a lot of money to take a horse that's in training out of training for a period of time. So just to remind you, and we'll not go into all the detail, when, when people talk about structure, they really mean the skeletal frame. Uh, this is the frame that you should see, and we're not going to talk about body condition scoring or anything else tonight, but uh, that's what you do in body condition scoring. You see, how much of the skeleton do I think I can physically see externally? And the more you look at horses, you see this horse is the top of his withers uh, because of those thoracic vertebrae that stick up that high. It's just as high uh, as the top of the, the sacral vertebrae or over the top of the croup. Uh, I'm more interested in the angles of these bones than I am the length of the bones. The length of the bones are going to make him taller, uh, but we can also make him taller by opening up and making a steeper shoulder that we'll talk about in just a second, or a steeper hip, 
uh, or a more vertical stifle to hock, which would make him posty and not as athletic. So a lot of times we've selected horses genetically to be taller when in fact we've made them uh, worse as, as athletes. So just because a horse is taller doesn't mean he's going to jump faster, jump higher, or, or, uh, or run faster. So be very cognizant of these angles. And I'm going to put most of the angles, in fact, I'm moving a quiz tomorrow in our uh, anatomy class. And the two angles I'm most concerned about as far as athletic ability is the angle of the shoulder, the scapula to the humerus, and the angle of the pelvis, if you will, the pelvis to the thigh bone or the, the pelvis to the, uh, the femur. So we're going to talk about those in just a little bit of detail. Uh, and again, I, I really feel superficial in this presentation and the article that supports it in the magazine because uh, you can't dig into all these things in enough depth. But uh, you should all be able to look at a shoulder blade and see that spine of the scapula that's sticking up there. And we'd like to see a well laid back long shoulder that's got good slope because that angle of the shoulder blade to the arm is going to determine how the horse is able to reach uh, and extend. And when you saw that dressage horse or that race horse, or we're going to see a Morgan horse in a little bit that's got his knee up there. Um, if he can't move his shoulder blade and have that well laid back, he's not going to have a lot of length of stride uh, in his front leg. Um, they've drawn this picture diagram to the right here like those are always 90 degree angles and it's always the same angle of his pasture uh, and his shoulder and I think most of you know that's not true. Uh, I do like the way they've made sure that the angle of the pastern is the same as the angle of the foot at the toe. Um, and I do like the angle of the shoulder, but they certainly aren't all the same in this case. Uh, that shoulder you should be able to see, and I think it's real important to the uh, alignment of bone uh, in the front leg. And I think I've already said most of this. The shoulder blade should be sloping and long. Uh, the more angle there is in that shoulder blade to arm, the more he's going to be able to uh, extend. And we all know horses that can stand still with a pretty steep shoulder, um, but then have the ability to loosen. And when you exercise and loosen and soften a horse, what you're really doing is stretching those muscles and tendons so he can move his shoulder blade and his joints further, which allows him to move um, a lot more athletically. It allows the longer stride. Uh, it impacts the way the neck comes up out of the shoulder. Uh, and it's certainly when you have a good stroke, be careful. The shoulder blade is not the withers. The shoulder blade is completely loose from the rib cage. There's no joint that attaches that other than through muscles uh, and tendons and, and a few ligaments uh, to hold that all together. But that front column of bone is completely um, non-articular, non, non, no joint connects that. So that's all able to move. And if you can see in this racehorse, the angle of the shoulder has lifted way up high. And it's not flat, but it's certainly more horizontal. And now his arm, or from the point of his shoulder down to his elbow, has almost come more vertical. And that's what's got to happen in order to allow these horses to reach forward uh, and move not only by the uh, horizontally like this, but also horses that lift their uh, front end. So uh, the pasture and angle is similar, but I'm really more concerned about the shoulder angle. Um, genetically, the thoroughbred horse you saw on the previous slide, uh, and the Morgan Park horse or Park uh, Pleasure horse, English Pleasure horse, is going to have the uh, ability to lift his knees uh, and hocks much more higher. So obviously if we want a saddle type experience or a saddle seat type horse, a park horse, a road horse, whatever, we need to pick breeds that can do that. And to think that any breed is going to lift its knees and hocks as high as a hackney pony or a saddle horse or a Morgan horse um, is expecting training to do a lot. Let me put it that way. Um, I'm an Appaloosa judge, and they have a saddle seat pleasure class in the Appaloosa breed, but it's a rare Appaloosa uh, that can really move with the elevation of a saddlebred. So within that breed, you can certainly judge horses that are best at doing that particular uh, activity. And if that's the breed you show, then you need to have that pedigree and breed. But if we're looking for the athletic ability and the performance ability, some people would say that um, it's not the breed that's critical, it's the confirmation and the movement.
Um, I would point out, and we're not going to go a lot into muscle anatomy tonight, but um, the way this horse can move his front leg is largely dictated by where he carries his head. Uh, there are muscles that go from the top of his pole, uh, or his atlas, if you will, between his ears, all the way down inside of his neck and in the inside of his uh, front leg and hook to his shoulder and hook even down to his arm and, and elbow. Um, the brachial cephalicus muscle, in fact, um, works like a big rubber band. So if a horse had his head real high and elevated like this, then he has the ability to lift his forearm like this. But this is directly genetic, and it can be enhanced with training. But confirmation is going to dictate how this horse is able to move his front leg. Um, and if you see the point of the shoulder on the right front leg that's elevated, the point of that shoulder is much, much higher, of course, than the front left shoulder. So the front end is really important. We spend a lot of time evaluating feet and legs in horses because that's where the horse gets usually gets lame. When we talk about lameness in horses, and I'm not a veterinarian, I'm a horse nutritionist by training and a, a horse trainer by uh, and judge by experience. Um, yeah, legs are important, and university people and veterinarians probably put more emphasis on legs when they're judging and evaluating um, because that's where they go lame. But the whole horse has got to be evaluated and, and selected uh, along the way. We have a lot of problems here, but the important thing is that you look at the horse's foot on the leg on the left and say you should be able to drop a line um, from the front of the, the withers down through the horse's shoulder, down his radius or the, his forearm, down through the middle of his knee, down through the middle of his cannonball, and it ought to come down to the back of the heel. Any deviation from that is, is serious, but let me express, and some of this is opinion and some of this may be fact, but a horse's knee usually bends in the direction uh, of this buck-kneed horse or this horse that's over at the knee. Uh, a horse that's over at the knee definitely has some tendon problems. Uh, he may have had some congenital ligament problems, uh, but he's probably not going to hurt his knee as much being over at the knee than one that's back at the knee or calf knee. Uh, yeah, it, we notice that buckling over a little bit faster, and sometimes it's caused by physitis, and sometimes it's not, uh, or tied in at the um, behind the knee. But a horse that's real back at the knee or hyperextended in his knee uh, is definitely going to have more problems in carpal chips and, and front of the knee kind of bone problems. Uh, we've talked about horses real straight at the pasture, and I don't have one that's too angular at the pasture. And, uh, horses that are camped in, camped out, all those things. But when you stand beside a horse, the important thing for me is you can drop a line down through there, and it, that's the way he naturally stands. If we walk around in front of him, uh, I think we need to be able to look at this and say again, these drawings are really hard for me, and there's not even one underneath one of them. Uh, but on the left, he's straight. That line should come down, and I don't like the way it's drawn exactly, but it should come down through the middle of the radius, the middle of the knee, the middle of the foot. Very few horses stand perfectly straight. Very few of us stand perfectly straight. Um, if we're talking about extreme deviations, then we've got a real toed out and a real toed in horse. Again, the toed in horse is going to paddle real wide, and we're going to see that on the next slide. He's going to move, but he's not going to hit himself. He may hit the horse next to him, and he's going to have a lot of problems in his movement. He's not going to be very, very athletic, uh, but he's not going to hit himself. This horse that's extremely towed out, uh, and if you combine that with the base narrow horses over at the, at, to the right, he's going to do a lot of damage because he's likely going to hit himself. That foot's going to swing in, and let's go to the next slide so I can show you. Uh, the horse here on our right, um, if he's real toed out, he's going to swing his leg in, and he could actually, with his shoe, hit at speed way up high in the side of his cannon bone and break a sweat bone. And a lot of race horses, um, a lot of reining horses, a lot of horses that work at speed will always wear um, rundown boots or, or splint boots to protect their legs. You don't put those boots on to hold the splint in and keep it from popping out. You put those boots on to protect the horse's leg 
oftentimes from injury from the other leg. Um, I would venture, if you're going to evaluate performance horses, a horse that stands a little bit towed out is going to be more athletic and likely be a, a better mover in the, in the athletic point of view than a horse that's a little bit towed in. A towed-in horse oftentimes has a lot of heavy muscle, and he's a real wide mover, and he's going to move a little more like a truck. Uh, some of these best um, loping horses and cantering horses that I've ever been around uh, and really nice movers are a little bit towed out, um, and then you just trim that out of them. So the extreme case is what I'm worried about uh, in the front end. I'm going to just keep going and hopefully allow us to ha have time at the at the end and get through the structure stuff. But uh, conformationally, if we looked at the same column of bone but now from the side in, in the rear legs, I'd like to be able to drop a line as in the middle here, this lateral view, drop a line from the point of the buttocks or the back of the pelvis actually uh, to the back of the hock and down the straight line to the back of the fetlock and down. That's far enough back. In fact, this may even be a little too far back for a really good athletic horse that needs to get his hind end underneath him. What's not said here, and if you look at the point of the stifle on the left picture, I'd like to see the point of the stifle up underneath the, the what I call the point of the hip, which here is called the tubercoxy. I would like to see a straight line from the point of the hip down. In other words, I'd like to see the stifle as far forward as possible uh, so that that horse can uh, flex the stifle and can push off a lot along the way. Many, many, many of our western breed, stock type breed halter horses are getting excessively, excessively posty with their stifles right back up over their hock. Or in other words, the, this uh, tibia in the back leg is, is, is too vertical. And that puts a lot of pressure on the stifle. It puts a lot of pressure on the hawk. <clears throat> As we walk around behind the horse, I'd like to see a straight column of bone again. Uh, this caudal view or this horse from the rear is a little narrow. Some of you, if you're draft horse people, say, no, Russell, you're out to lunch. I'd really like to see him narrower to where this, the hock and the fetlock are, are right in almost touching each other. But the key to that is that the cannon bones are still parallel, that the hocks are no further apart or no closer than the, the pasterns are, the, the fetlocks. So this is kind of the structure we look for. On the right, there's all kinds of deviations from that, uh, from the side. Um, I'd like to see him like the one they've got named correct, or sickle hock puts a lot of stress on the hocks themselves, and we often see curbs associated with that. These horses that are way camped out, um, yeah, that cannon bone is vertical, but he's going to be hard pressed to ever get his hind leg up underneath him um, and be able to engage the way we described earlier. So he's really going to have to work. Uh, the posty legged horse is a little camped under, but they've tried to draw what I'm talking about is the stifle to hock is too vertical. You know, there's no ideal horse and there's no ideal world here. So when you're buying horses, they're all going to have some holes. They're going to have some problems. And you have to decide which of these problems will you live with. And that's where the experience of a trainer or somebody comes in and maybe an experience that some of these problems are minor. And other problems, uh, like an extremely sickle hock horse with a curb, uh, or a lot of swelling and inflammation in the hock, could really be some problems. Um, if we're selecting our next performance horse. As we go to the next slide and think, uh, I really like this diagram on the left because it shows the stifle angle and it shows it clearly up underneath the, uh, the point of the hip. In other words, that stifle ought to be, uh, when the horse is really working hard, I've seen horses that that stifle actually bumps the rib cage. They should be able to flex that hip and, and really engage that hind end and get that leg all the way up underneath them and, and rub it against the flank. Most of our horses, certainly our rail horses, our hunter horses and our uh, pleasure horses don't ever get close to that. Um, but I think you have to think about these joints and a lot of push is going to come from the stifle and the hock and the, and the fetlocks behind. And when we get to injecting joints, 
Uh, this is a scary practice to begin because uh, uh, dry joints and other things uh, can be creating a great problem and, and when you're evaluating a horse that's something I would ask is if you had to inject the horse's hocks uh, or, or fetlocks and usually you do that because they're stiff uh, oftentimes they're, they're swelled and puffy uh, oftentimes they uh, uh, just can't flex them at the, the way and that's why that flexion test earlier and other things are useful evaluations. A lot of times an experienced show horse that's been hauled all over the country and has really got a lot of points or money on him or something, um, he'll be the disposition you want but he's probably got a lot of stiff and sore joints. He may not be the most athletic prospect that you're going to have uh, if you really expect to go somewhere with a performance horse. We walk around behind the horse, and this is more of a draft horse confirmation, but what I want to do is point out um, two things. This, this horse that's uh, on the left, they say, is correct, but for a draft horse, too wide. Uh, the horse that's second from the right that says towed out, that's more what a show uh, draft horse would be used to thinking and looking like. They actually are shoeing them now and trimming them in a way to flare that foot and tow their foot out uh, a little more than I would like. But that horse is not cowhawked. That horse is straight in his hind end, but he's just too narrow, and they've got him flared a little bit just in his foot. The cowhawked horse is the second from the left. And the reason you say that is because his hocks are pointing in towards each other. These horses have tremendous stress uh, and are likely to see a lot of bog spavins and thoroughbreds and other problems, but a lot of angle on his hocks uh, there. Uh, I think an athlete can use that and work with that structure, a cow hock, better than the horse in the middle. The horse in the middle to me is the horse that has the most hock problems. You don't see very much of this, but the horses I see that do this and stand like this, many of them have been created like that because you took a horse that uh, originally looked like a cow hocked horse or a little towed out and you told the farrier they had to make them tow straight ahead. Um, they may move their feet in straight and then their hocks bow out. So I'm really concerned athletically about these horses that bow out, particularly in their hocks, and uh, certainly are pigeon-toed. So just they need to be straight, and if anything, I'll tolerate them being narrow and straight much sooner than being wide and straight. That structure stuff, uh, we we'll talked just a little bit about muscle. Obviously, muscles different in every breed. Uh, and I want to see either volumes of muscle like stock type horses and halter horses or I want to see more expression. Now this absorbing ad horse uh, has a lot of expression of muscle. I don't normally see quite this much but when you can see individual muscles that horse is pretty fit. If you can't see any muscles um, I tell my wife I'm heavily muscled uh, but she can't see any individual muscles so um, that's probably fat uh, and not muscle. So uh, in halter horses we've said fat's the prettiest color for years and years and years but we need to see definition of muscle. If I'm going to see a lot of muscle I want to see a lot of muscle in the rear end of an athlete and not in the shoulders. The more muscle you pile on the front end of the horse the, the heavier the front end is and the more difficult it is to, to lift. So, yeah, a lot of muscle is important in a halter horse, um, and we could debate a long time. If you're picking halter horses, you better be picking balance and muscle. If you're picking athletes, you better be picking balance uh, and movement uh, and athletic ability, and that means more muscle in the rear quarters than in the front quarters. When we talk about quality, we talk about quality in lots of different ways. Uh, quality of movement, quality of, of confirmation. I think the most important thing is when you glance at a horse, a performance horse or a breed uh, specimen, that you have no difficulty telling what breed it is, and it's pretty. Folks, we're going to talk in a second. It costs just as much to feed an ugly horse as it does a pretty horse. And if you're going to ever buy a horse, I hope you buy a pretty horse because you might want to sell that horse someday. And people are going to say, that's a nice pleasure horse or that's a nice, in this case, Arabian Stallion horse or whatever. And most of that's shown around their uh, head, their neck, their bone, how they're moved. You could talk about this in a lot of ways. But um, quality means breed quality. Quality means refinement and balance. 
So how they do their job is one thing, but I'd like them to be a little pretty while they're doing it. Now, you all are going to think this is a crazy slide to took in here. I took this slide myself uh, in Kathmandu. Um, they were loading this, uh, which is in Nepal, by the way. Um, they were loading this horse to try this donkey to try to get all the weight so he didn't have to carry this big old heavy load, and they kind of overdid it. But the important thing is that disposition and heart of a horse yes quiet disposition so you can get along with him is important but disposition to try disposition to be willing to take what some trainers call trainability or they'll take training uh, easily it's something that's very difficult but in the hundred day test of a lot of uh, performance horses in Germany and other uh, European countries they evaluate how willing is this horse to be trained how hard does he try? When he hurts a little bit, does he just whimper and give up, or does he just push on and dig into it? And it's such a hard thing to evaluate, but any good performance horse that I've ever trained on has a little bit of charisma. It has a little bit of spunk or attitude. Uh, my wife doesn't want attitude in her lesson horses. I need attitude in those three, two, three, four-year-old uh, horses that we're going to make pretty hunters. Uh, I've made a little bit of money over the years and lost a lot of money um, buying three-year-olds that don't run very fast uh, and trying to make them into hunters, and, and some of them make better jumpers, but they better be proud of themselves a little bit. They need to have an attitude, and I've seen some horses that stand, and their angles of their legs and their shoulders look like they'd never be able to do anything, but you get them warmed up and go out there, and some of them just love it. So how do you evaluate whether a horse just loves what he's doing? Um, what I call heart uh, ambition uh, is a tough thing to evaluate, but it's something you need to include in this formula uh, when you're looking at your next performance horse, because some horses will try at the lower level, and they never will move above a certain level in competition uh, because they don't try hard enough. Trying hard is something that I work with students. It's hard to evaluate how hard they try sometimes. You just look at the results. Here at the end, I'd like to touch on just a couple other things as we get ready for some questions and so forth. But uh, everyone says, how much should I have to spend? I always answer that because uh, I work with a lady by the name of Colleen Brady that did a degree at Michigan State that looked at costs of boarding horses, and I've done a lot of surveys. Uh, you're going to spend uh, a lot of money. Some people would say, no, I can do this for you know, $100 a month. Some would say, no, it takes me 300 in my market. It's 500 to get them trained and kept. Whatever it is, um, you could easily spend $5,000 a year in expenses hauling and way more than that, of course, but um, taking care of the health of the horse and boarding the horse and getting at any degree of training. So the second bullet there makes me think, I don't really care how much it costs. You better be able to buy the best horse that makes your needs, and you better be able to take care of him every day uh, with this cost. So initial purchase price is not your big expense. Now, some of you are going to spend 60, 80 on a uh, thousand on an investment of a really high-level performance horse. Maybe this five thousand doesn't matter to you, but um, I think you need to purchase the best horse you can. You purchase a horse that you can uh, find that you either have the ability yourself or know that you're going to have to pay to, to train on him uh, and haul him. Uh, not everybody needs this high-dollar horse, and in today's market. We could go forever about this, but there's a lot of cheap horses on the market right now, folks, and they may not be the horses that you want, but the good horses are always going to be expensive, and the bad horses in the bottom end are always going to get cheaper and cheaper, and now we don't even know what to do with them. But you need to find the best horse you can to meet your needs, um, and quite bluntly, if you're worried about the purchase price, I'm more worried about whether you can take care of him and get him to the level that you can... Um, succeed uh, down the road. So there's one other issue I was asked to talk about, and in fact, uh, maybe, um, and that is breeding. Uh, the original article I wrote for this uh, actually had a lot on breeding. Um, that's been covered by other speakers, and that's good, uh, because I don't want to encourage you all to go out and breed your replacement, breed, breed your next horse. Nothing is better and more exciting and more fulfilling to look at a horse coming out of a ring or won a race or a fraturity and say, you know, I bred her. That's pretty fun. 
and I've done that a few times, but I usually have lost money trying to breed a great one. I would much rather, as my friend old Paul Shue, may him rest in peace, said to me one day here in town, Mark, I'd rather just go buy one. Because in the long run, there's a lot of, of investment, a lot of time, a lot of money that you need to think about. And uh, we're not going to go into all this at this point. But if you choose to breed, you better start with the best mare you can possibly afford. Yes, diets are important, but it's just like in humans. If they don't have a good mama, you're not going to make one with the sire. Uh, I haven't been very successful with that, at least. My three are wonderful because of maternal abilities. Um, same with horses, and it's expensive. And you can breed the best horse to the best horse, and you can have an accident. You can have a lost foal. You can have injury. You can have just one that grows up being nothing, you know. So uh, I'm not saying you shouldn't breed one. I admire and we need people to keep breeding great ones. But for me, the average person that's going to go out and buy a horse for their next prospect probably needs to buy it. And we can answer questions or debate that if, if you would like for for sure. At the end of the day, and, and um, evaluating a horse, there's no easy answer, no degree sitting in at some university is going to tell you uh, how do you go by the perfect horse and make sure the next horse is, uh, um, is the right one. Uh, you need to evaluate you. And that's been the biggest mistake I've seen people make is they go out and buy a wonderful new horse, but it doesn't fit them at all. And that horse, they'll struggle with it. They'll take it to trainers. Trainers can make it good. But if you and this prospect don't work together as a team, it's not going to work. Um, again, I, I really think you need to spend a lot of time evaluating not only yourself, but hunting and searching and working with people and talk to people and networking. And do not buy the first horse you go look at. It's kind of like uh, some of us that go to the mall and we find the perfect shirt. Um, or perfect suit or something, and uh, I'm happy to buy it and leave to get out of the mall, not have to really go into the mall itself, but to just go as close as I can and leave. My wife would say, no, that's a nice suit and that's a good price, but let's go look at this store and this store and this store and this store, and this is why I married her. You know, I get aggravated, but you need to do your homework. You need to take your time um, to find the right horse and then get somebody else's opinion. Know how far that horse can go. If a trainer says this is the horse that can take you to the world or take you to the Congress or take you to the Nationals or take you to the Breeders' Cup, um, they're putting themselves way out there. And it's most likely, in my mind, unless you've already gone through the first three or four levels of this deal, your next horse isn't going to take you all the way. Your horse, next horse is going to take you to the next step. And then you've got to go from there and see what's going to take you um, beyond that. So uh, I want you to have fun. I want you to have a good experience. But an awful lot of people get burned buying their next horse uh, when it was probably a little nicer or a little fancier or a little more expensive or the opposite. It had major problems uh, and they didn't realize it and they didn't do their homework and they didn't have a third opinion. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to hope that you have some questions. I haven't seen any text chat uh, through all this. Um, I'm convinced that there's 17 people out there, so if you have questions, this would be a good time to uh, to ask. Or you can tell me how cold it is where you are. Okay, I've gotten a nice thank you letter from one person, and I've gotten a question that, uh, is there such a thing as a true all-round, and I think she means an all-round performance horse. Um, I spent 10 years ago, I spent a year in Australia, and um, they have a horse industry that's um, 
about like the population of the state of Texas spread across our whole country. So they don't have as huge a demand uh, and market for horses, and their horses are what our horses were when I was growing up in the 70s. They were truly all-round horses. They didn't have a specialized market like we do now. Uh, and I'm of the opinion in our world, in our industry, uh, you can have an all-round youth horse, you could have an all-round 4-H horse, you can have an all-round something, but that horse is probably going to be, and it could be, an, it could be the honor roll horse overall, but that horse is probably not going to be the horse that wins one event or one world championship and goes all the way. And we have now a very specialized industry in the United States. And I hate to say this, but in the United States, um, the horse that's going to win the reigning. Uh, is a lot different than the horse that's going to win the halter, unfortunately. We have performance halter classes. Um, a horse is going to be difficult to win the jumping class and also win the pleasure class. So, yes, I think there's all around, and I think it goes back to those basic confirmations and balance that we're looking for. Uh, they can do hunter, they can do English, but they can't do a great saddle type, saddle type horse. Um, it's hard to have a country horse and have a park horse at the same time. So my answer is at the lower levels, definitely, you can have an all-round horse. At the higher levels, I think when you have aspirations to go and win the big time, you're going to have to have a horse that specializes, in my opinion, uh, more in that. Um, the next question has to do with, with, with a horse that has a good confirmation but turns out uh, at one shoulder, what would be your primary concern? Um, this is really important when we look at the overall horse. Uh, my opinion is it only depends on how much that one leg deviation affects the horse's movement and performance. Um, you have to be very careful to what I call single trait select. Um, if you get back and look at these horses and say, hey, overall, this is clearly the best horse, uh, and he moves a little um, sound, but it looks a little different in that one leg or that one area, uh, then I'd be concerned about that, but I guess it just depends on degrees. Um, frankly, I don't know how to handle that. My primary concern is the, sh the question is turns out on one shoulder. So the question is, does he turn out from his elbow? Does he turn out his whole leg? If his whole leg turns out a little bit, he's kind of pinched at his elbow, uh, I don't think I'm going to worry about that if he can do his job. If he can't do his job, then I'm concerned about that. But overall balance, uh, I'd probably be liking him and see if he can uh, move well enough for what I want to do. Will a shorter horse with a big overstep be a stronger, better mover into shots? Probably so. Um, I won't guarantee anything, but a shorter horse may be shorter because he has better angles. And the taller, bigger horse may be just steeper in his shoulder and steeper in his hip uh, and have some problems. So. Uh, uh, with the horse that you're talking about, a big overstep, I'm always going to try to select for horses with big oversteps because my experience is that those are the horses that have the most drive and the most lift. Um, and I don't think there's anything on the dressage uh, uh, score sheet that says there's any coefficient for size. Um, they're really into about um, behavior, uh, movement, and athletic ability. The horse we were talking about that toes from the shoulder out is, is young but turned out all the way from the shoulder down. So um, this is not going to change. If she's young, that's fine, but we're not going to straighten her. Uh, so the question is, will that angulation affect the way she moves? And again, I only care about how high does she go. She's going to be able to do just fine if it's a low stress, um, trail pleasure kinds of activities. If we're going to take her. Um, to higher levels of dressage or reining or more athletic cutting, things that she's going to have to use her front end a lot, then maybe I'd be concerned. But um, you may know an awful lot. You're from a nice farm, so you probably know. But maybe you need to ask somebody else's opinion um, that could do a radiograph and actually see her. How much does a short neck affect the horse's movement? I'm more concerned about the way the neck comes out of the shoulder. The neck is a balance beam for the horse, and it reaches out there with its neck. Um, but if the neck is upright and right up there, and it's clean in the bottom, the way the neck comes into the shoulder, I wouldn't be concerned. If it's a real heavy neck, and the neck comes out of the front of the shoulder, uh, and it's a short neck, now we got some major problems. Because the lower that neck comes out of the front of the shoulder, uh, the more 
difficult it is for the horse to lift and, and to use his neck up and down. Sure, I'd like to see a long, clean neck that comes higher out of the shoulder uh, for athletic purposes, but uh, if it's clean, if it's high, I'm not as concerned about the neck length. And be careful, all the horses have seven cervical vertebrae. So you got to decide, and I know it's, it's a term we all use, but you need to be very careful what you mean by short. So is it the shape of the neck, is it really the length of the neck, or is it how high it comes out of the shoulder, how clean it is in the throat latch. Uh, we use a lot of terms talking about conformation of horses that anatomically really don't make sense. So you got to really evaluate and look, and, and I think most people that say short neck uh, really mean thick neck, thick in the throat latch, low in the way it comes out of the shoulder, and those things would get in the way. But the actual length, if it's upright and clean, I don't think would be a problem. come to the end of the presentation. I just want to thank you all for participating tonight and um, thank you to Dr. Russell for being our expert speaker. If you have um, questions or comments um, about the web presentation, we would like to hear back from you. Please email info at myhorseuniversity.com and you can also go to our website myhorseuniversity.com as well. Thank you so much.